Well, it's uh, not going to be a surprise to anybody that um, North Korea, a conflict there could be the most disruptive development in terms of global markets, the global economy. But I think um, I might add a more nuance there to say that investors and others, I think, look at North Korea risks in terms of um, binary outcome. Either status quo continues, uh, you know, sort of tensions without get, going any further, or if there is a conflict, you know, full-blown World War III. Uh, I think there are other possibilities uh, within the, the range of, of outcomes. Uh, U.S.-China trade tensions, uh, for example, uh, that could happen anyway outside of North Korea, but they could also be part of uh, frustration from Washington, for example, with China. Uh, cyber attacks and the lack of clarity on, on the U.S. side in terms of, you know, recent uh, signaling about possible bloody nose to, to North Korea. And is there such a thing as a surgical strike um, in, in such a highly complex theater? So North Korea is the thing that uh, is at the top of, of most political risk analysts' um, worry list. But usually, of course, the thing that goes wrong is not the thing that's the top, at the top of anybody's list. <laughs> that's right. And, the, and the black at Davos every year, um, we have these conversations, and it's usually something else that happens. Minister, why don't you flag up to us what you think is the number one issue? Well, I was listening. I, I, I view it slightly differently in the sense that there's those things that uh, would be the biggest risk but perhaps have the least likelihood to occur because by virtue of the fact that they are the most significant uh, through to those that are probably very likely but have less of an impact. Um, in a trade context in terms of economic impact, uh, what I would probably rate as highly likely and potentially a problem uh, would be if there wasn't the opportunity to secure the renegotiation successfully of NAFTA. Um, the implications that that would have on potentially the US economy, the Mexican economy, the Canadian economy would be significant. Um, but of course, we have geopolitical considerations like North Korea, like the South China Sea, where we've had you know, a heightened level of activity, although I would note uh, that China has been engaging constructively. We've seen some uh, resolution of some of the tensions around the South China Sea. Uh, and Australia certainly adopts the view that we encourage all of those parties that are having those discussions to continue making progress around it. But um, right here and now, in terms of implication, interruptions to supply chain, uh, issues around the NAFTA renegotiation, and I agree, um, the potential ramifications as well in terms of retaliatory action around US trade policy, China trade policy. Robin, jump in. <laughs> What's left to feel bad about? Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm struck, I, I would, with Tina, obviously, want North Korea has to be on your list for the obvious reasons. I do think, however, Kim Jong Un has done a pretty good job of getting himself and North Korea to a place where he can go. Well, I've stopped here, you know, for a bit at least. Now I challenge you to decide whether you want to take me on or not. Um, so I think there is a there's a dimension to which that may just calm itself down for, for at least for a period of 2018. Dangerous words to say, but I'll, I'll say I've said them, so I can't take them back. Um, second point. Uh, there is a, a sense that the global economy is kind of caught in two places. There's the optimism driven by the American sort of boost from the Trump stimulus push. But at the same time, as I think Steve Chibu is saying, we have not yet seen the other foot drop. And there's a whole slew of trade decisions coming up uh, for the US administration. And at some point, you could hit a tipping point. Maybe the odd intellectual property uh, decision or fridges or solar panels doesn't get you there. But if it gets to a structural point, like NAFTA or something, that'd be a big worry. I think the other part of the... You have to mention the Middle East. I'm gentle, I'm afraid I have to say that as well, just because although I don't see an obvious conflict there, uh, in a way you have a cold war between Saudi Arabia and Iran rather than a hot war, uh, there's a lot of internal instability amongst many of the countries. Maybe we'll come back to that. And I think there's a, it's, it's just a very edgy time across the Middle East. And my last point, um, the Russian elections are coming up uh, April, I want to say, uh, mid-time mid of this year. Um, you know, Ukraine is not looking steady to me at the moment. I hate having to say that. I think everyone wishes the Ukrainian government, wishes Ukraine to do well. But it's a, it's a weak position, and the Russian government knows how to take advantage of weakness. So I think Europe better keep its, its eye out, out to the east. Hey there, thanks for checking out CNBC on YouTube. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of the day's biggest stories. You can also click on any of the videos around me to watch the latest from CNBC. Thanks for watching.